This presentation illustrates the great cultural wealth of the knowledge found in the Vedic literatures and its relevancy in the modern world. We will show, by means of high-tech research techniques, that statements and materials presented in the ancient Vedic literatures agree with modern scientific findings and they reveal a highly developed scientific content. Techniques used to show this agreement include satellite imagery of the Indus Saraswat River system, marine archaeology of underwater sites such as Dwarka, carbon and thermoluminescence dating of archaeological artifacts, scientific verification of scriptural statements, linguistic analysis of scripts found on archaeological artifacts, and a study of cultural continuity in all these categories. Early Indologists wished to control and convert the followers of Vedic culture. Therefore, they widely propagated that the Vedas were simply mythology. Max Muller, perhaps the most well-known early Sanskritist and Indologist, although later in life he glorified the Vedas, initially wrote that the Vedas were worse than savage and India must be conquered again by education. Its religion is doomed. Thomas Macaulay, who introduced English education into India, wanted to make the residents into a race that was Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinion, in morals, and in intellect. However, the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer stated that the Sanskrit understanding of these Indologists was like that of young schoolboys. These early Indologists devised the Aryan invasion theory denying India's Vedic past. They taught that the English educational system is superior. They intentionally misinterpreted Sanskrit texts to make the Vedas look primitive. And they systematically tried to make Indians ashamed of their own culture. Thus the actions of these Indologists seems to indicate that they were motivated by a racial bias. Innumerable archaeological findings and their analysis have recently brought the Aryan invasion theory into serious question. This theory is still taught as fact in many educational systems despite much contrary evidence. The Aryan invasion theory is that the Vedic Aryans entered India between 1500 and 1200 BCE. They conquered the native Dravidian culture by virtue of their superiority due to their horses and iron weapons. They imported the Vedic culture and its literatures. This Aryan invasion theory, however, deprives the inhabitants of India of their Vedic heritage. The wealth of their culture came from foreign soil. The Aryan invasion theory raises an interesting dilemma called Frawley's Paradox. On the one hand, we have the vast Vedic literature without any archaeological finds associated with them. And on the other hand, we have 2,500 archaeological sites from the Indus Saraswat civilization without any literature associated with them. A preponderance of contemporary evidence now seems to indicate that these are one and the same cultures. This certainly eliminates this paradox and makes perfect sense to an unbiased researcher. Facts which cast serious doubt on the Aryan invasion theory are there is no evidence of an Aryan homeland outside of India mentioned anywhere in the Vedas. On the contrary, the Vedas speak of the mighty Saraswati River and other places indigenous to India. To date, no evidence for a foreign intrusion has been found, neither archaeological, linguistic, cultural, nor genetic. There are more than 2,500 archaeological sites, 
two-thirds of which are along the recently discovered dried-up Saraswati River bed. These sites show a cultural continuity with the Vedic literature from the early Harappan civilization up to the present-day India. Several independent studies of the drying up of the Saraswati riverbed all indicate the same time period of 1900 BCE. The significance of establishing this date for the drying up of the Saraswati River is that it pushes the date for the composition of the Rig Veda back to approximately 3000 BCE as enunciated by the Vedic literature itself. The late dating of the Vedic literatures by Indologists is based on speculated dates of 1500 BCE for the Aryan invasion and 1200 BCE for the Rig Veda, both now disproved by scientific evidence. Max Muller, the principal architect of the Aryan invasion theory, admitted the purely speculative nature of his Vedic chronology and in his last work, published shortly before his death, The Six Systems of Indian Philosophy, he wrote, Whatever may be the date of the Vedic hymns, whether 1500 or 15,000 BCE, they have their own unique place and stand by themselves in the literature of the world. It can be scientifically proven that the Vedic culture is indigenous, through archaeology, the study of cultural continuity, by linguistic analysis, and genetic research. For example, the language and symbolism found on the Harappan seals are very Vedic. We find on these seals the Om symbol, the leaf of the Asvata or holy banyan tree, as well as the swastika or sign of auspiciousness mentioned throughout the Vedas. Om is mentioned in the Mundaka and Kata Upanishads as well as the Bhagavad Gita. The holy Ashvata tree is mentioned in the Aitariya and Satapatta Brahmanas as well as the Taitariya Samhita and Katyayana Smriti. The pictorial script of these Harappan seals has been deciphered as consistently Vedic and termed Proto-Brahmi as a pre-Sanskrit script. High-resolution satellite images have verified descriptions in the Rig Veda of the descent of the ancient Saraswati River from its source in the Himalayas to the Arabian Sea. Pure in her course from the mountains to the ocean, alone of streams, Saraswati hath listened. The mighty Saraswati River and its civilization are referred to in the Rig Veda more than 50 times, proving that the drying up of the Saraswati River was subsequent to the origin of the Rig Veda, pushing this date of origin further back into antiquity, casting further doubt on the imaginary date for the so-called Aryan invasion. This satellite image clearly shows the Indus Saraswat river system extending from the Himalayas to the Arabian Sea. Here, the Indus river is on the left, outlined in blue, while the Saraswati river basin is outlined in green. The black dots are the many archaeological sites or previous settlements along the banks of the now dry Saraswati river. The drying up of the Saraswati River around 1900 BCE is confirmed archaeologically. Following major tectonic movements or plate shifts in the Earth's crust, the primary cause of this drying up was due to the capture of the Saraswati River's main tributaries, the Sutlej and the Dristadvati by other rivers. Although early studies based on limited archaeological evidence produced contradictory conclusions, recent independent studies, such as that of archaeologist James Schaffer in 1993, showed no evidence of a foreign invasion in the Indus Saraswat civilization and that a cultural continuity could be traced back for millennia. In other words, archaeology 
does not support the Aryan invasion theory. Marine archaeology has also been utilized in India off the coast of the ancient port city of Dwarka in Gujarat, uncovering further evidence in support of statements in the Vedic scriptures. An entire submerged city at Dwarka, the ancient port city of Lord Krishna, with its massive fort walls, piers, wharves, and jetty, has been found in the ocean as described in the Mahabharata and other Vedic literatures. This Sanskrit verse from the Moshala Parva of the Mahabharata describes the disappearance of the city of Dwarka into the sea. After all the people had set out, the ocean flooded Dwarka, which still teemed with wealth of every kind. Whatever portion of land was passed over, the ocean immediately flooded over with its waters. Dr. S. R. Rao, formerly of the Archaeological Survey of India, has pioneered marine archaeology in India. Marine archaeological findings seem to corroborate descriptions in the Mahabharata of Dwarka as a large, well-fortified, and prosperous port city, which was built on land reclaimed from the sea and later taken back by the sea. This lowering and raising of the sea level during these same time periods of the 15th and 16th centuries BCE is also documented in historical records of the country of Bahrain. Here is a glimpse of the massive Dwarka city wall. Among the extensive underwater discoveries were a large door socket and a bastion from the fort wall. Two rock-cut slipways of varying width extending from the beach to the intertidal zone, a natural harbor, as well as a number of olden stone ship anchors were discovered, attesting to Dwarka being an ancient port city. The three-headed motif on this conch shell seal found in the Dwarka excavations corroborates the reference in the scripture Harivamsa that every citizen of Dwarka should carry a mudra or seal of this type. All these underwater excavations add further credibility to the validity of the historical statements found in the Vedic literatures. Apart from Dwarka, more than 35 sites in North India have yielded archaeological evidence and have been identified as ancient cities described in the Mahabharata. Copper utensils, iron, seals, gold, and silver ornaments, terracotta discs, and painted grayware pottery have all been found in these sites. Scientific dating of these artifacts again corresponds to the non-Aryan invasion model of Indian antiquity. Furthermore, the Matsya and Vayu Puranas describe great flooding which destroyed the capital city of Hastinapur, forcing its inhabitants to relocate in Koshambi. The soil of Hastinapur reveals proof of this flooding. Archaeological evidence of the new capital of Koshambi has recently been found, which has been dated to the time period just after this flood. Similarly, in Kurukshetra, the scene of the great Mahabharat war, iron arrows and spearheads have been excavated and dated by thermoluminescence to 2800 BCE, the approximate date of the war given within the Mahabharat itself. The Mahabharat also describes three cities given to the Pandavas, the heroes of the Mahabharat, after their exile. Paniprasta, Sonaprasta, and Indraprasta, which is Delhi's Puranakela. These sites have been identified and yielded pottery and antiquities which show a cultural consistency and dating consistent for the Mahabharat period, again verifying statements recorded in the Vedic literatures. Although early Indologists in their missionary zeal widely vilified the Vedas as primitive mythology, 
Many of the world's greatest thinkers admired the Vedas as great repositories of advanced knowledge and high thinking. Arthur Schopenhauer, the famed German philosopher and writer, wrote that I encounter in the Vedas deep, original, lofty thoughts, suffused with a high and holy seriousness. The well-known early American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson read the Vedas daily. Emerson wrote, I owed a magnificent day to the Bhagavad Gita. Henry David Thoreau said, In the morning I bathe my intellect in the stupendous philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seems puny and trivial. So great were Emerson and Thoreau's appreciation of Vedantic literatures that they became known as the American Transcendentalists. Their writings contain many thoughts from Vedic philosophy. Other famous personalities who spoke of the greatness of the Vedas were Alfred North Whitehead, British mathematician, logician, and philosopher who stated that Vedanta is the most impressive metaphysics the human mind has conceived. Julius Robert Oppenheimer, the principal developer of the atomic bomb, stated that the Vedas are the greatest privilege of this century. During the explosion of the first atomic bomb, Oppenheimer quoted several Bhagavad Gita verses from the 11th chapter, such as, Death I am, cause of destruction of the worlds. When Oppenheimer was asked if this is the first nuclear explosion, he significantly replied, Yes, in modern times implying that ancient nuclear explosions may have previously occurred. Lin Yutang, Chinese scholar and author, wrote, India was China's teacher in trigonometry, quadratic equations, grammar, phonetics, and so forth. Francis Voltaire stated, everything has come down to us from the banks of the Ganges. From these statements we see that many renowned intellectuals believed that the origin of scientific thought was the Vedas. The Vedic literatures contain descriptions of advanced scientific techniques, sometimes even more sophisticated than those used in our modern technological world. Modern metallurgists have not been able to produce iron of comparable quality to the 22-foot-high Iron Pillar of Delhi, which is the largest hand-forged block of iron from antiquity. This pillar stands as mute testimony to the highly advanced scientific knowledge of metallurgy that was known in ancient India. Cast in approximately the 3rd century BCE, the six-and-a-half-ton pillar over two millennia has resisted all rust and even a direct hit by the artillery of the invading army of Nadir Shah during his sacking of Delhi in 1737. Vedic cosmology is yet another ancient Vedic science which can be confirmed by modern scientific findings. And this is acknowledged by well-known scientists and authors such as Carl Sagan and Count Morris Maeterlinck, who recognize that the cosmology of the Vedas closely parallels modern scientific findings. Carl Sagan stated, Vedic cosmology is the only one in which the time scales correspond to those of modern scientific cosmology. Nobel laureate Count Morris Maeterlinck wrote of a cosmogony which no European conception has ever surpassed. French astronomer Jean-Claude Bailey corroborated the antiquity and accuracy of the Vedic astronomical measurements as more ancient than those of the Greeks or Egyptians, and that the movements of the stars calculated 4,500 years ago does not differ by a minute 
from the tables of today. The 90-foot-tall astronomical instrument known as Samrat Yantra, built by the learned king Suwai Jai Singh of Jaipur, measures time to within two seconds per day. Cosmology and other scientific accomplishments of ancient India spread to other countries along with mercantile and cultural exchanges. There are almost 100 references in the Rig Veda alone to the ocean and maritime activity. This is confirmed by Indian historian R. C. Majumdar, who stated that the people of the Indus Saraswat civilization engaged in trade with Suma and centers of culture in Western Asia and Crete. An example of these exchanges is found in the inscriptions on the Heliodorus Column, erected in 113 BCE by Heliodorus, a Greek ambassador to India and convert to Vaishnavism, as well as a 2nd century BCE coins of Agastocles, showing images of Krishna and Balaram. These artifacts stand testimony that Sanatan Dharma predates Christianity. This also confirms the link between India and other ancient civilizations such as Greece and shows that there was a continuous exchange of culture, philosophy and scientific knowledge between India and other countries. Indeed, the Greeks learned many wonderful things from India. Voltaire, the famous French writer and philosopher, stated, Pythagoras went to the Ganges to learn geometry. Abraham Seidenberg, author of the authoritative History of Mathematics, credits the Sulba Sutras as inspiring all mathematics of the ancient world, from Babylonia to Egypt to Greece. As Voltaire and Seidenberg have stated, many highly significant mathematical concepts have come from the Vedic culture, such as the theorem bearing the name of the Greek mathematician Pythagoras is found in the Shatapata Brahmana as well as the Sulba Sutra, the Indian mathematical treatise written centuries before Pythagoras was born. The decimal system based on powers of 10, where the remainder is carried over to the next column, first mentioned in the Taittiriya Samhita of the Black Yajurveda. The introduction of zero as both a numerical value and a place marker. The concept of infinity. The binary number system, essential for computers, was used in Vedic verse meters. A hashing technique similar to that used by modern search algorithms such as Google's was used in South Indian musicology. From the name of a raga one can determine the notes of the raga from this Kattapayadi system. The Vedas however are not as well known for presenting historical and scientific knowledge as they are for expounding subtle sciences such as the power of mantras. We all recognize the power of sound itself by its effects, which can be quite dramatic. Here, a high-pitched frequency shatters a drinking glass. So, we can easily understand that loud sounds can produce substantial reactions. It is commonly believed that mantras can carry hidden power, which can in turn produce profound effects. The ancient Vedic literatures are full of descriptions of weapons being called by mantra. For example, many weapons were invoked by mantra during the epic Kurukshetra war, wherein the Bhagavad Gita itself was spoken. The ancient deployment of Brahmastra weapons, equivalent to modern-day nuclear weapons, are described throughout the Vedic literatures. Additionally, mantras carry hidden spiritual power which can produce significant benefits when chanted properly. Indeed, 
The Vedas themselves are sound vibrations in literary form and carry a profound message. Spiritual disciplines recommend meditational practices such as silent meditation, silent recitation of mantras, and also the verbal repetition of specific mantras out loud. A clinical test of the benefits of mantra chanting was performed on three groups of 62 subjects, males and females of average age 25. They chanted the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra 25 minutes each day under strict clinical supervision. Results showed that regular chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra reduces stress and depression and helps reduce bad habits and addictions. These results formed a PhD thesis at Florida State University. Spiritual practitioners claim many benefits from mantra meditation such as increased realization of spiritual wisdom, inner peace, and a strong communion with God and the spiritual realm. These effects may be experienced by following the designated spiritual path. Most of the evidence given in this presentation is for the aparavidya, or material knowledge of the Vedic literatures. The Vedas, however, are more renowned for their paravidya, or spiritual knowledge. And even superior is the realized knowledge of the Vedic rizis, or saints, that which is beyond the objective knowledge of modern science, knowledge of the eternal realm of sat, chit, ananda, eternality, blissfulness, and full knowledge. But that is another presentation. For further information, please visit our website, www.gosai.com. This presentation illustrates the great cultural wealth of the knowledge found in the Vedic literatures and its relevancy in the modern world. We will show by means of high-tech research techniques that statements and materials presented in the ancient Vedic literatures agree with modern scientific findings and they reveal a highly developed scientific content. This devised the Aryan invasion theory denying India's Vedic past. They taught that the English educational system is superior. They intentionally misinterpreted Sanskrit texts to make the Vedas look primitive. And they systematically tried to make Indians ashamed of their own culture. Thus the actions of these Indologists seems to indicate that they were motivated by a racial bias. Innumerable archaeological findings and their analysis have recently brought the Aryan invasion theory into serious question. This theory is still taught as fact in many educational systems despite much contrary evidence. The Aryan invasion theory is that the Vedic Aryans entered India between 1500 and 1200 BCE. They conquered the native Dravidian culture by virtue of their superiority due to their horses and iron weapons. They imported the Vedic culture and its literatures. This Aryan invasion theory, however, deprives the inhabitants of India of their Vedic heritage. The wealth of their culture came from foreign soil. The Aryan invasion theory raises an interesting dilemma called Frawley's Paradox. On the one hand, we have the vast Vedic literature without any archaeological finds associated with them, 
And on the other hand, we have 2,500 archaeological sites. Techniques used to show this agreement include satellite imagery of the Indus Saraswat River system, marine archaeology of underwater sites such as Dwarka, carbon and thermoluminescence dating of archaeological artifacts, scientific verification of scriptural statements, linguistic analysis of scripts found on archaeological artifacts, and a study of cultural continuity in all these categories. Early Indologists wish to control and convert the followers of Vedic culture. Therefore, they widely propagated that the Vedas were simply mythology. Max Muller, perhaps the most well-known early Sanskritist and Indologist, although later in life he glorified the Vedas, initially wrote that the Vedas were worse than savage and India must be conquered again by education. Its religion is doomed. Thomas Macaulay, who introduced English education into India, wanted to make the residents into a race that was Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinion, in morals, and in intellect. However, the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer stated that the Sanskrit understanding of these Indologists was like that of young schoolboys. These early Indologists